OK, then we start. Tim is, will be here later on. OK, so today <coughs> we basically <coughs> keep on going with the discussion we, on, the, on, the <coughs> on the closure and the type of uh, uh, equation that you get once you coarse grain. And we will probably be a little bit uh, uh, more specific on these uh, issues. So the fact that uh, by breaking things in pieces and then uh, trying to glue in them together, uh, you have some general features which are emerging. So you have <coughs> system which develop memory in space and time. You develop the uh, stochastic aspect. And yesterday, we have been discussing mostly the emergence of these feedback loops between the macro and the micro level so that the cause effect uh, relation, which is uh, one of the building pillars of knowledge, goes a little bit under question. Oh, you were so <laughs> thinking that you have been, that have been much later. So, um, and I was saying that, I was suggesting that the fact that cause and effect can no longer be uh, sequenced, uh, like uh, cause coming f ahead of the effect, is, in my opinion, almost the definition of a complex system. So today, <coughs> we elaborate further than this. <coughs> and from tomorrow on, we will, we will put some flesh into the bones and see some practical examples of how you solve practical problems. But for today, I will stay still on the, on the mathematical aspect, trying to keep the mathematics at the minimum to convey uh, as general as possible uh, concepts. So let's uh, go back to what we were discussing yesterday. So the fact that. Uh, when we break the system in, in pieces and we try to describe the system at a much coarser level where capital X would be just a handful of variables in the face of an, an original system which might contain order of Avogadro degrees of freedom, the equation for X gets complicated because it feels the effect of the uh, correlation coming from the, sub, from the sub layers. I should have, in fact, organized the sublayer in a vertical line, but I had no space. So I put them in a horizontal line. So this will be the correlation coming from level 2, level 3, level 4, level 5. And uh, in fact, one would expect that this uh, feedback loop, so this is the way the correlation acts on the coarse grain, and this is the return loop. Normal wisdom would uh, suggest that these arrows get thinner and thinner, which I didn't do. I apologize in the, in the picture. But these arrows should get thinner and thinner as you move along the hierarchy to the point where, when you have moved far enough, in fact, you could assume that these arrows are basically vanishing. And that's the point where you are supposedly making the truncation. So as I said yesterday, these equations generally look horrible. Please do not forget that here we have been starting from the simplest possible. How do I grab some? Ah, this is the chalk. I've never seen chalk like this. <laughs> Interesting. So please don't forget that we were starting really to the simplest possible abstract representation, so a simple system like this. And we end up with a rather awful uh, series of correlation, which we discussed yesterday. So I remind again for the few of, the, of you who have not been here yesterday that this is the landscape. So the way the force acts upon the correlation. And this is the uh, structural uh, shape of the way the, the statistics of the correlation feeds back into x. Now, you might remember that. Yesterday, we defined, uh, I d we defined this mu p is basically the integral in time of the pth order uh, correlation from t minus h up to t plus h. So h is the uh, window of the filter. And we said that frequencies, modes which, in fact, last less than h are just washed out when you do the average. So based on this definition, we would expect that, in fact, these, uh, these uh, kinetic moments would scale more or less like h power p. And uh, so if h is small enough, that is, gives you a solid basis to conclude that as you move along, in fact, this moment should just fade away. But we will see that that's not necessarily the case. That's C is the deviation. I'm sorry. Yes, so I should, in fact, recap. So remember that we started from this splitting. Okay. 
So capital X is the coarse grain signal, and Xi is the fluctuation on top of it. Okay. And and mu are the kinetic kinetic moments. So I think this structure has been discussed yesterday. And yesterday, we con we, uh, I, when I asked the question, OK, why do we want to make our life so complicated? That, well, actually, complicated. The idea is that by coarse graining, we have many less variables, but the equation we have to solve are much more complicated. So it's not obvious where the trade-off is. But for sure, the point is that you can do closures, as we say. So at some point, you can say, I don't need the moment order 6. I could just set it to 0, do something more intelligent. One way which, for instance, worked uh, rather well in the case of turbulence is something called extended self-similarity. I, I will not go into any detail, but it's really extremely useful for turbulence, is, is to say that if you have a moment of order p, and p is greater than q, actually, you would express this moment as simply as a power. I mean, this would be exactly the case if this is mu p is a power of h, like this, uh, you see that if I have mu q would be h power q and mu p would be h power p, so this would be exact. The point is that, as I said yesterday, there are prefactors in front of it, and these prefactors, in fact, contain all the statistics of your system. Okay, but you can make guesses on these prefactors, and for instance, let me ask the question: If I have just a Gaussian distribution, which is a normal situation for for a well-behaved physical systems, all I have to specify is the variance, so the moment order 2. And all the other moments would follow precisely this uh, uh, expression. And of course, we would also know what the constants in front of it are, because they are basically p factorial over q factorial, something like that. So just to say that if you happen to know the entire distribution, and we will go in a moment to the statistical picture. If you happen to know the entire distribution of the, of the uh, variable xi, then your problem is solved because you can compute, in principle, all of the moments. Okay? But, I mean, this means that you already know the solution of your problem. Okay? If you don't, and that's the interesting part, if you don't, you could still postulate some expression like this, which would, in fact, convey information only is less than uh, the entire information contained in the distribution, but hopefully you capture the relevant physics with the lowest order moments. That's the typical situation, I would say, all across modeling. That generally, you try to capture the lowest order moments, hoping that what is left in the higher order moments will be somehow irrelevant in the sense that I'm, I'm uh, depicting in, the, in this picture. So just to say that you have a, a concrete and a specific uh, strategy to close this equation, because once you postulate uh, such an expression, then you can try to investigate what happens by changing these constants, and, and, and then you can develop some sensitivity for the response of the problem. So these are called dynamic closures, because of course, the moments in general are a function of time themselves, and they might depend on the, on the macroscopic state as well. So this is, a, 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 is an appropriate uh, definition is appropriate. It's appropriate to call them dynamics because this is not just something which is written once and for all. They go along with the evolution of the system. So I think this picture more or less conveys the strategy of of, um, of the closure. Okay, I think I can. So now I want to uh, switch. Well, I've already switched to statistics. The, use, the point of using statistics is because normally you use statistics when dynamics gets too hard to solve. That's the general trend. And uh, uh, for those of you, most of you, I think, have got training in statistical physics, and you know that in statistical physics there are two major avenues. One is the one due to Boltzmann, dynamics and trajectories, and there is a second one which is due to Gibbs, which is statistics geometry, okay? And in the end, they are both fascinating, and uh, I would say, but maybe Tim can, I would say that for equilibrium systems, Gibbs is much more powerful. It's a it has a, a geometric elegance. Um, uh, but as when it comes to dynamics, to understand not only what the equilibrium state is, but how you get there, then you need to put some dynamic information. That's Boltzmann. But in a way, there are some systems for which the two pictures are basically dual. They are equivalent. And these are called ergodic systems. I'm sure you have heard about this word. Uh, I don't know much about ergodic system. They get very easily. Uh, quite uh, complicated from the mathematical point of view. 
But as far as we are concerned, for us, ergodic simply means that I can replace a time average with a, a statistical average. And I mean, a mathematician would kill me on this line. Okay, but nonetheless, the, the, I try to convey the sense of the, of the ergodic, the, the idea of switching from dynamics to statistics when dynamics is just too hard to be uh, solved. Suppose we have an observable which I call A, and A is just a function of the state of our system, the microscopic state, okay? So one way of computing the average, in general, in physics, we are interested in the pressure, in the temperature. So you're not interested in just uh, the trajectories of the atoms of the, of the individual elements of your system, all the more so because they are far too many, okay? So one way of defining a, a reasonable definition of average over an observational time capital T would be just to take, you just compute the value of A along the trajectory of your system. For each value of the trajectory, it could be the kinetic energy, it would be the derivative square, it could be the potential energy, whatever. So it's a local function of x of the trajectory. And then, in a way which, which really sounds like a crime to a mathematician, you can just do this simple thing. You just replace dt dx dx, okay? And you say that dt dx, I have no space here, but uh, you can put dt down, so this, this becomes one over dx dt, let me write it. <coughs> it's right to, to write all this in PowerPoint. So I have, uh, what is it, dt dx dx, and I can always write this as one over x dot dx, right? Where x dot is dx dt, okay? But this, as we know, is nothing but f of x, and so in the end I can construct a probability distribution function p, which is nothing but this. I mean, you can check it, I think, on the spot, okay? I take one over t, which I forgot here, from here, and this is nothing but x dot over x. Just to say that they can transform, in fact, the trajectory into a probability distribution function. This is a useful trick in general. No matter which kind of physics you do, when you want to move from dynamics to statistics, it's a nice trick. In practice, it's a little bit more, uh, to be less formal, what would we do? Suppose that this is a, one of the trajectories of our system, say an atom or a signal or whatever, and this is the range of your, or your trajectory. What you would do, you would, I think it goes with the definition of a Lebesgue integral in mathematics, uh, if I remember correctly. Then you can strip your variable, your space x, and you say, how much time does the system spend between here and here, or there and there? So you slice it out, and you just count how much time your trajectory is spending into this strip. So in our case, it would go from here to here. We are always within the strip, then we quit it, and we go back here. And you can just construct the statistics of how much time you have been spending here. And in this case, for instance, if I uh, focus on this strip and this strip, I can generate an histogram. And then I generate a lot of trajectories. And what I end up with is a full distribution, which would be nothing but P of X. I'm, I'm sure you, have, you must have been doing something like that in, in your life, okay? So the advantage of this is that apparently by the time you do uh, the, the ensemble average, by the time you sum over many of these trajectories in the initial conditions, you generate an histogram, you generate a distribution, and uh, that's exactly the distribution you need to compute the average. So what happens in real life, so in general you have a distribution of xi which is conditioned to the value of the macroscopic value. So this distribution, for instance, the variance of the fluctuation might change from place to place depending on the value of the macroscopic uh, state variable. So in general, you have a function which is a function of psi and parametrically depends on the moments like this. And so the, the, the bootstrap, the, 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 the thing we have been discussing before is just you can postulate the form of this uh, momenta and then you close your problem. Now, these are two typical situations. So this is a Gaussian, I think is a log log. So as we were saying yesterday, Gaussian, the fluctuation die out very rapidly. The probability for you to be five sigmas smarter than the average is 10 to minus 10, I guess. But if you have a Cauchy distribution, long tails, distribution like this, then the probability of being 
uh, five, ta five sigmas away from the average is maybe one over 100. So uh, outliers are much more frequent. And please appreciate that this distribution, uh, the moments of this distribution are not convergent. Moment from order, second order on, they diverge. Okay, so these are very different situation and these, the fat tails, these ones, are, are in general associated with the persistence of the decays we were discussing yesterday. Uh, and uh, and it's sometimes this is called extrema, extremal dynamics, so the dynamics of the, the statistics of extreme events. This will be an extreme event because uh, it's much farther away from the average and it would uh, contribute a lot to the momentum, even though, so the contribution to the, to the integral of this uh, uh, relatively infrequent events is, is still very high, although they are very, much apart from the average. Well, this is just a mathematical interlude. I would say that the way, in, in fact, uh, you, you generate the, the force acting on the macroscopic variable, the one you need to know, it's, uh, it's basically an a, a average on a, on a random translation. So in other words, if you have the, this is an initial force, f of x, what you have to do in, uh, to compute the coarse grain force is basically to translate by an amount of size. So you go maybe from here to there or from here to there because you have a full distribution of size. And normally this the H is a typical size of this distribution in the sense that the probability of generating a profile which is much further than H is basically zero. And you immediately see that once again the same story by doing this uh, kind of uh, averaging, you are basically generating a sort of Doppler broadening of your profile. So generally the signal which you get, if you start for instance for, from a Gaussian here, you will end up with, an, with another Gaussian with, with a larger uh, variance. So it's a form of smoothing. And again, in practice, this can be useful if you want to regularize divergent series, which is also something which often happens in, in field theory. Uh, but, but that's another story. I mean, just to mention that the idea of generating a coarse grain force is associated, in fact, with the notion of random translation. And you take an average over this distribution of random translation. So typical cases. Is it a typical case? I want some question because otherwise I get I, I, I'm sure I'm, get, I'm getting boring to you. So what is this? This is an extreme situation. What does this correspond to? If the, this, just to make sure that I make myself understood. Suppose now I postulate that the probability distribution is just a delta pointed around zero. What does that mean? It means that I have just, I'm totally determined, I just forgot about the fluctuation, right? I mean, I, I, I apologize, I don't mean to be too trivial, but just to make sure that I'm not obscure. If I say that the distribution of the fluctuation is just pointed, sharply pointed around zero, it means that I just forgot, barely, totally forgot about fluctuation. Which sometimes, it looks like a crime, but very often we do, I will show you an example where you do similar things, not so crude, but not much more sophisticated than that either. So we were starting from this, and they say, I don't want to know anything about fluctuation. I will just run on my computer this, this period. Same F, right? So that's just tantamount to completely forgetting about fluctuation. So if I go many slides back, okay, it means that my coarse grain equation, which is, please note the difference between capital F, which in principle contains all the correlation, and small f, which is the original one, and here is all this, the cascade. This is where all the contribution from the moment come. I just say that this is zero. So capital F and small f are the same, and they just integrate the very same system on many less degrees of freedom. Very crude. Sometimes you find that if the system is very forgiving, you can do something like that. And once again, I drop all this part and just keep, uh, actually in this case, sorry, I would say that all the moments are zero. So this system is totally annihilated. This, the down floor is totally washed out. That's a bit crude. 
you can do slightly better than this. And that's the typical, this is a large domain of mean field theory that you basically keep yourself busy only with the Gaussian distribution. Okay? So you're saying that your fluctuation are Gaussian. And frankly speaking, I must admit that in my country, I wouldn't make the name, but a very glorious person uh, wrote in a book that basically all fluctuation of physical systems are Gaussian, which is a very embarrassing statement. Of course, it's not like that. That's the typical domain of uh, what yesterday we called well-behaved physical systems. You do not negate that fluctuation are there because otherwise, as I said, you just completely drop fluctuation. You just say that they are Gaussian, and eventually you can make your, uh, the variance of your Gaussian uh, is not necessarily a number, can be a function of the macro state. And that's a typical uh, situation where the fluctuation would not be flat dead. They would basically perform a sort of Brownian motion around the uh, macro state. But I would like to keep it a little bit more colloquial. So I will stop here and ask for uh, if there is anything which has not been crystal clear, I would like to, to pick it up now. Otherwise, I keep talking and, and I, is everything uh, clear? Okay. If this is the case, so here is no statistics, here is conventional well-behaved statistical behavior, and here we're going to the ground of uh, the wild system. So as I said, this is a totally different uh, type of the behavior. Here we have fat tails. And as I was saying before, in this case, the, the hierarchy, which I was, I would refer very often to that, to this, we have no guarantee, in fact, that this system of equation will have a finite solution at all times. This, solu this system may very well blow up. Yeah, absolutely no guarantee that you have a finite solution for all the moment at all times. And if you are in a... Phys well, what does that mean? That the physical system also uh, diverges or some kind of, kind of divergent behavior? Or is it uh, the result of cost phase? I I think, no, no, it's basically the, the system. Take the financial markets, for instance, you know? <laughs> the, the if you try to model the financial market, I think people did, I would refrain from doing that these days, but I mean, uh, the system is wild enough that there is no chance that by writing down the system equation, you would see a finite solution for all the moments. Because, uh, no, no, this is not the result of cost graining. This is the fact that the underlying uh, flux, the, the underlying statistics, this is an example, a typical example, turbulent mixing. You take a really si a very innocent system. You take a two-dimensional flow, okay, and you put a passive scalar, which is this, uh, looks like pepper, right? So this is a turbulent flow. These are vortices rotating one way or the other way. And you put some pepper, and the pepper has no back reaction on the flow. So it's a passive. So that means that uh, the, if I take one of these dot, black dots, it would just move with the fluid, and u is the horizontal velocity of the fluid, and v is the vertical velocity, and so you just track this trajectory. Even if the fluid is not that complicated, even much simpler fluid than this without vortices, if you have some time dependence, it's, it, tap, it might happen that the statistics of this particle gets wild. So they can develop even the depend only on x? No, no, they depend on time. That's crucial. Sorry, x, y. Sorry, I, for, I, for, sorry, yeah. I apologize. Fine. Should be u, x, y, and t. t is crucial. Okay? Because otherwise the flow is frozen and, and there is nothing to say. But even if the, um, the structure of the carrier, the fluid, is simpler than that, I mean, if it's turbulent, no question. Uh, but there is some time dependence. Uh, for many time uh, fluid flows like this, the you take a particle here and you measure the statistics of, uh, uh, you, you take many particles, you compute the average trajectory and you compute the fluctuation on top of that. And the fluctuation of this would in fact result in a, in a, in a fat tail like this. Now, I'm, I'm not sure now which, which uh, index, but it will not be a Gaussian for sure. Diverge. Yeah, by perfect range will diverge. And then this Lyapunov story, chaos, I really don't want to enter this deterministic chaos, et cetera, et cetera. So just to say, and so if you take the financials, please. Why is the time uh, dependence 
necessary to get a chaotic behavior, because even in a static field like that, you would get divergent trajectories for very close starting conditions. Uh, yes, but uh, I think the, um, I'm, I'm not sure now about the exact connection between the Lyapunov exponent, which is the divergence of nearby trajectories, which certainly can happen if the flow is time independent but complicated enough. But I think the, the development of fat tails and this type of statistics cannot, uh, don't tell me too much on this, uh, is uh, uh, you cannot get, uh, how is it? You cannot get this distribution uh, functions unless the flow itself is time dependent. I, 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 sorry, I cannot reproduce that. I can look it up in the literature. Uh, you find in the, the books of dynamical chaos. But my message was that in response to Tim is that this is not the result of cross-graining, uh, but uh, the system has to have some wild, I mean, in a way, Tim, let me put it this way. When we go back to the master equation like this, um, it is clear that, how would I say, um, I mean, there is a structure in this equation. So the way, for instance, this structure, p times mu p times un minus mu p plus n is quite general. I mean, any system will have that, okay? But uh, then the, 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 the derivative, so what we call the landscape, this depends on the physical system. I mean, that's it. If you want, this is written in the, in the stone once and for all. So uh, independently of the cons grain, and this is a property of the physical system or, or the natural system you are, you are uh, inspecting. And I think it's the interplay between uh, these two factors, the, 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 this structure and the landscape, which generates divergence or convergence of this equation. So it really depends on, on your system. I mean, not on, it depends on both, because the way you cross grain will affect uh, the definition of the moment, but the, this structure uh, is general and the, the specifics are contained in the derivative. So just to say that the complex systems are typically in a situation like, and of course you, all, you are all familiar with, I mean this was from another talk, but I mean you are, this is almost, the, 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 uh, I think it's a very powerful metaphor of chaos, right? That the butterfly uh, wing uh, that uh, if a butterfly, how do you say, beats his wing in Cuba, then you can have a storm in Florida. And, it's, it's an exaggeration, but sometimes uh, not, not too much of an, of an exaggeration. So just to say that many physical systems develop high sensitivity to initial condition, and, and in this case, all the machinery we have to be putting in place would show uh, a divergence. So this equation would diverge. Um, now, um, all I've been saying refers again to this very simple uh, system. And now let's try to, to go a little bit further. And how about we have just something which is, oops, sorry. I'm still uncomfortable with this, although, although it's very practical. So if you have a particle moving in a, in a, in a potential, in a force, so now we become a, a single particle Hamiltonian, then we will have an equation like this. And uh, if you do the little algebra, you see that your structure gets more complicated because at this point, your moments become, get two indexes because they have the uh, cross correlation between uh, the fluctuation in the position and the fluctuation in the momentum. In principle, you could say that they are independent, but in practice, you have no guarantee. And then you generate an equation for a double series of moments, okay? which has, again, a certain structure, but just to, uh, this just conveys the idea that the algebraic structure of this equation for the fluctuation gets more complicated, and uh, all the more so if you go to high-dimensional spaces, and if you go to full many-body Hamiltonian, then you have to take into account also uh, the space separation. So suppose we have, for instance, a box here with molecules, you just coarse grain the, bo the box and you say that you have a capital R coordinate, which would be the, the blue ball here, with a capital R sub i. So capital I would be an index for the whole box. And small i would be the address of the green particle within the capital I box. So we have shifts for each of these boxes. And you can imagine that the hierarchy for this system just gets awful. I mean, you you develop uh, 
if you have n particle, you have n times n minus one over two double correlation. These are the shifts, so the position of the single molecule within the coarse grain molecule. And that's exactly what I meant when I said that our analytical mathematics is really pales in front of this type of complexity. Now, is it because this is a sort of irreducible complexity of the real world or just because we have been choosing the wrong language? I really don't know. But the fact is that there is no chance. Remember what I said yesterday, uh, that in principle you can construct dynamic equation for the second order correlator and the second order correlator, the Zeno paradox. Whenever I, I ask for a correlation order two, the correlation order three comes into play. And it's an endless hierarchy. But here, yeah, things get awfully more complicated because you have n, and n is a large number of this, uh, this particle. So there is no way, in other words, that you can hope to solve these equations in, in the way that analytical theory would, would suggest. And that's exactly what I meant when I said that our mathematics is ill-suited to this. So and here comes the point to make a cultural switch and go to the title. In fact, I think I, the, the second lecture, should, should I called it computational and metadynamics. It's almost metaphysics, but in a serious sense. Uh, so it, by the way, before I start, any question regarding, I think the only take home message is that this closure system, which I developed in order to be formally clear, when you confront it with the real systems, uh, with many variables, get just gets you get an horrible tangle cor tangle of correlation, and there is no way you can hope to solve these equations with the, uh, with the mathematics as we know it. So, um, in the recent years, I would say in the last maybe ten years, there has been a new, I would say, I would say, way of thinking. I mean, I don't want to be as glorious as Steve Wolfram when he writes a new kind of science. Um, this is a much more modest point of view, but still it's, it's a cultural switch as compared to the things I've been showing you before. Uh, please appreciate that this idea of building up dynamical equation for the moment has been really the mainstream all over statistical physics and also field theory. Okay? Because people thought, I can be smart enough to construct effective equation which I can solve. The new generation of idea is that uh, you don't even try to do, I mean, you try to do that, but you don't insist that you derive the cost grain equation uh, from the very bottom. The idea is that you would invent fictitious particle dynamics, and I call it meta because this particle dynamics will be designed in such a way to fulfill the basic symmetries of the problem but you do not necessarily require that you are able to derive this metaparticle dynamics out of a, a, a microscopic level in a rigorous way. Of course, here you close your eyes, but you close in a, in a confident way, and you hope that you are smart enough. Uh, it is a top-down view. You say, OK, I know more or less. Remember what I said yesterday. In the closures, you put some knowledge of your system, some empirical knowledge of your system. Okay. And you try to make up with the mathematical complexity with your intuition. That's really the, the, S, the reason why closures are useful is because they allow you to inject your own experience or, or feeling on the, on the physical knowledge of your system without taking the hard mathematical uh, way. And here it is the same. So you say, I have a system. I can try to design top down a meta particle dynamics. I will give you examples such that these dynamics will, of course, elim eliminate all the details which do not matter for the question I'm asking, and eliminate them at the outset. So I formulate a simplified dynamical model, and hopefully a model which is simple enough that I can solve it on my computer. Of course, the rigorous statistical physicists will tell you, what are you doing? You are just, I mean, uh, how do you know that your system is reasonable, et cetera? But the fact remains that over the last 20 years, and this is just a small list, the one I'm comfortable with, but I'm sure you can add more, there are several quite remarkable examples where the philosophy worked pretty well. This will be a course on its own. Lattice gas cellular automata is a way of solving fluid dynamics working at this level, except that your atoms and molecules are Boolean. 
that's a beautiful story, but I mean, I, of course, no, it is. But the, the, the philosophy you can really get. Instead of writing Newton equations as they are, the ones I showed you here, okay, you can write the sort of Newton equation for Boolean particles where all you need to know is whether a particle is there or not, mass one, and the velocities are highly constrained on a lattice. And you can show that if you're smart enough, you can get to the right Navier-Stokes equation, correct Navier-Stokes equation. So you solve this physics with this mathematics, but highly simplified. I'm sorry if I'm moving too fast, but conceptually, the point is that you don't need to put the physics and the mathematics in the same box. The physical question you're asking if it is fluids, uh, I'm comfortable with fluids, but in our, in, for, you, for those of you who do, say, quantum mechanics, even in quantum mechanics, I mean, you have the Schroeder equation, which would be here, but very often we work with density functional theory where the main object is the de electron density, right? Which is a fluid variable, okay? So in other words, it can be, uh, in general, you are interested in, in physical question at, at rather uh, high level. To me, I, here is macroscopic and here is underlying microscopic world. Micro and macro, sorry. In English, it's difficult to distinguish. So lattice gas error automata for fluid dynamics has been quite useful. Last, lattice Boltzmann is basically an outgrowth of this idea, except that instead of working with uh, Boolean molecules, you work with a, a very simplified Boltzmann equation, and we are using it all the time here in our, uh, even here in, in our um, practical projects. In, uh, we have been using quite a lot for the last few years. Uh, dissipative particle dynamics is again another technique which instead of using Newtonian equation use a macro particle and it's very useful for polymer melts and for this type of problem. I think we can put even the, the famous Carparinello molecular dynamics in, into this family because what they do they generate a sort of fictitious uh, Lagrangian which uh, as far as I know, cannot be derived by, uh, by first principle, but I'm not an expert on that. They postulate it, okay? So that it serves their computational purposes without destroying the relevant physics. So all I'm saying is that there is a whole bunch of methods which have not been derived ab initio from, from the underlying macroscopic world the way the uh, rigorous statistical physicists would do, but they work nonetheless pretty well to solve problems which would probably just be unreachable if you try to, fa to attack them from using the, 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 the mathematical apparatus I've been talking about so far. Of course, I mean, I'm pretty much into this philosophy, but you have, very often you get uh, some allegation that you are just too rough, you, you neglect important things. I think it's perfectly fine as, so, as long as you know that you are constantly in danger of violating some basic nature of constraints, and the word for this is realizability. In other words, if you invent a model top down, okay, and for some reason you invent a model which has no path from the microscopic world, so there is no micro to macro, you know that there are many, many, many ways of getting to the same macroscopic system coming from the down world, right? So this is the micro level, macro level. Actually, since there are many, in fact, the number of these paths is basically the entropy of this space, as you know from elementary uh, thermodynamics. What you're trying to do here is to select some of the most convenient one from the computational point of view. It's what Tim and I somehow sometimes call the principle of least computing. So they are not necessarily all equivalent from the computational point of view. So you postulate a model here, but if there is no path from here to here, then your model might teach you back. And I can tell you a personal story. We did that with the lattice Boltzmann in the early days. We postulated the form of a lattice Bo of a Boltzmann equation, which would integrate quite complex fluids. But from time to time, it was just exploding. And in fact, it was exploding much uh, less than it should have done. And only years later, at least five years later, we realized that we proposed an equation which in fact had no second principle behind. 
for reason which are too technical to say, here, to mention here, uh, it was pretty forgiving. So we were quite, quite lucky. But as a matter of fact, there was no microscopic path to this equation. Then other people found a way to restore it, and all of a sudden, the stability of the method improved by, say, an order of magnitude. So you're just kind of gambling, not gambling, you're playing an interesting game. So you are trying to shortcut the hard mathematics, but of course you have always to be conscious that if you break realizability, the system typically will eat back on you. Is, is that clear what I mean? Just might be the artificial intelligence in a way that you have, <laughs> no, they, they are saying that you have heuristic, heuristic guesses oh, yeah. in which you cut uh, lots of But and and they, they find and they say that the first value when it, uh, let's say, it gives you the right solution. Let's say, because okay. what you don't expect. Okay. So if I, I guess I should repeat to make. Uh, the, the point is that there seems to be some parallel with artificial intelligence, in the sense that to use heuristics to choose the right path. Okay. My back question is, what kind of criteria do you have to choose the right path? Because in physics, we have two really big avenues, which are the conservation principle. You want to conserve energy according to the first principle, and you want to, end, to have evolutionary constraints, which is the second principle. In general, they not, of course, they, they are not enough to select the best path, but at least they tell you which path definitely uh, you shouldn't take. I don't know what the equivalent criteria for, uh, for artificial in uh, intelligence are. I don't have an expert on that. Uh, but uh, I know that there are some mathematical structures, the past five and theories, in which, uh, let's say, you have basically usually an exponential number of uh, possible rules. And, and the basic idea is to, uh, I don't know how they choose it today, but they are, they are the known, I don't know how to say, they are the eligible rules. And Basically, what you're saying that I cut down most of it and I choose only, let's say, the left pass. Let's say, if we order it in, from right to right, left, mm -hmm. I always choose then the left pass, let's say. But you must have some physical criteria, I guess. Uh, Otherwise, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's a mathematical structure. It's uh, a mathematical structure. And, and, and uh, as I told you, that it's the process of like Tony uh, works with this. Okay. And, and if you can place the flow of language based on this. Uh, well, I know so nothing that. about this. But, uh, anyway, so it looks like uh, indeed we are, when you deal with complex systems, I mean, uh, the, 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 the standard mathematical apparatus is just too complicated, so you have to invent alternative rules. And just to be a little bit more specific, uh, oh yeah, but that's basically the thing I already said. It's interesting that, yeah, just to keep on going with this, uh, okay, constitutive relation is, uh, I will talk about them later, is essentially the way engineers, in fact, uh, and quite successfully took the problem. They say if I have a typical constitutive relation is that if I take some material and I put some stress on it, the resulting strain is proportional to the stress, and the, the proportionality constant, you don't know, but uh, you, you compute it. And so you say that strain <coughs> equals some constant times stress. Now, to, to know the value of this constant, you should know all the, the underlying details of the atomistics. But actually, uh, you can measure it. Or you, and for many systems, uh, you can characterize it quite, quite uh, accurately without knowing uh, this detail. So in general, uh, that's a typical situation where you would replace ignorance about the microscopic level with the, constitutive, with the relation between two macroscopic uh, quantities, which you know are highly correlated. And so you measure the correlation um, between them. And this is called constitutive relation. Sometimes constitutive relation might not exist. That's the point. And so the idea of uh, pursuing a bottom-up coarse grain, it might be really chimera, chimera in the sense that it's not the right way of doing it. And, and it's interesting, Walter Kohn, whom I think you know, is a, a Nobel Prize in chemistry years ago. And uh, 
in adventure in factor density functional theory, in a paper uh, as a similar remark on the hand body Schrodinger equation. He says that the hand body Schrodinger equation contains so much information when the number of molecules is high that is basically a non computable object, this one, okay? And uh, eventually, so the idea of solving exactly the hand body Schrodinger equation will basically take you nowhere and you have to invent some uh, heuristics or, or uh, some strategies like this, which I guess, but I'm not an expert, in this case uh, amounted to be the density functional theory and developments thereof. So just to be a little bit more specific, that's, that's an example of, uh, of uh, metadynamics is the lattice Boltzmann. In the lattice Boltzmann, I really don't want to go into the detail, but just to be a bit more specific, Essentially, uh, you have particles which can only move along the links of this lattice. Here is maybe more confusing, but uh, a bit confusing. But essentially, you have only nine possible directions. So, what distinguishes uh, the situations where uh, uh, you can have this bottom-up force graining uh, from those where uh, it might not be possible? Is there some kind of basic feature? that distinguishes those two cases? I think the basic feature is that... Um, because in some cases, you can think of ways of doing it. When right? the statistics is Gaussian, you can always do that. So now you would say, um, what are the system for which the statistic is, statistics is Gaussian? Well, I think if we... I mean, you know this much better than me. If I take some material, okay, and I... Strain the material. Typically, for most material, the the strain, the resulting strain is proportional to the stress, and this quant the quantity in between, which is the, the how do you call it, the viscosity, the dynamic viscosity, is just a number, and with a number you can characterize the response of your system. Okay. But that's a very special case. I mean, those are systems close to uh, equilibrium. Yes. And also oh yeah, yeah. Pretty close to linear behavior. So that's right. No, no, you're right. Restrictions. Yeah, 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 absolutely correct. In fact, now I should have to go back by many slides. I think you're, yeah, you have, you have uh, exactly the point. I think we were being, I think I have one where we tried to, you have to be close to equilibrium. I think I had one slide where I, where I, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I think if the system are not far too wild in space and they are weak departure from homogeneity, from equilibrium, then the fluctuation always regress. And I think we covered that yet yesterday when, I think even formally, when we write down, sorry, the equation for, uh, this we can skip, the, this term here. This is the fluctuation. Again, this is abstract, but nonetheless general. So this is the fluctuation. If we are in a system, state of the system where the force is zero, so you are at equilibrium. And the first derivative is negative, so they are in a stable equilibrium. The fluctuation is doomed. It will regress. Now, make this psi big. For some reason, you bring it off equilibrium. Turbulence, uh, financial markets, I guess. Then, in principle, all the machinery of the higher order moments, all the uh, non-small fluctuation come into play. And eventually, depending on, on your landscape, they will, might conquer the system. So I think some system, even if you bring them far from equilibrium, they go back, some other don't. Now, why that? I don't know. In general, I was used to the idea that, say, in turbulence, is because you have a lot of kinetic energy around. And so uh, disorder is kind of favored. I think in solid state, potential energy is uh, calling the shots. And frankly speaking, I'm not familiar. Are there any cases where in, in material science you would be far off equilibrium and fluctuation would never, ever be Gaussian? I really don't know. Crack propagation. Crack propagation. Because it's dynamic. Yes. That's right. I, I don't know of any theory. The int I think non-equilibrium should be the rule in real life. I mean, what I will say uh, yesterday in the beginning, so that you put non you sweep non-linearity under the, ra the the rug, and that has been quite successful, by the way. Not that, uh, but if you 
if we want to face problems in real life, many, most of them are out of equilibrium. We are out of equilibrium. We constantly need some inflow of energy, food, in order to, to exist, right? Otherwise, we would decay to. Local equilibrium is still alive, but local equilibrium is much uh, more versatile than global equilibrium because you can have coexistence of different local equilibria. T take a glass or a turbulent flow. You can have macroscopic domain where particles are in local equilibrium, but if you move to the next domain, they will not in equilibrium be in equilibrium anymore. So there is coexistence of many local equilibria. Okay, and that's an intermediate uh, situation. There are systems like, I think, the financial systems, the sy the non because the natural systems somehow have always uh, conservation, some form of conservation law, and this really helps uh, um, order, so to say. I think for some systems, you don't have the conservation laws, and so they can go much more wild, I guess. Uh, society, <laughs> I don't know, I'm really not an expert, but in general, the conservation law uh, help a lot uh, the idea that uh, uh, stabilize some of the system. I think in, in, uh, in, in a social system and system which do not have any uh, specific underlying conservation, the, the possibility of wild behavior is much higher. The two examples I have in mind are atmospheric science, which nonetheless are built in, 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 in the natural uh, laws, but manifestly are so complicated that they can develop wild behavior. And I think social systems, I don't think that you have conservation laws. Sometimes we are speculated that money, is money constant in time? No. Is it growing all the time like entropy? No. Well, the Federal Reserve can print any amount of dollars, you know, there's no conservation law for it. <laughs> so, but I, 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 I'm not an expert, but I, I think coming back to your, to your point, Tim, I think it really has to do with uh, Departure from local equilibrium, yes. Do we take a pause or? Okay. So, and from tomorrow on, I think we will really take a, a twist and I will show some practical, practical examples. <coughs> Like could if you got the rest. Yes. Yeah. 
mean, you have to, where, where you start has to be a physically plausible yes, yes, system yes, or you're going to get something weird. Right, right. right. But no, like what you were saying, a lot of both of them are Yes, yes, yes. No, he, yeah, he said, well, was it Greenspan? So I guess it was, yes. So there's some, something about, you know, beware of nerds bearing formulas. Uh, yeah. He might be not totally wrong, actually. I think that's true. Uh, because uh, a lot of this was sort of uh, put into the system all of a sudden. But, you know, it's, it's like the same thing with, uh, you know, the atom bomb. You know, the physicist energy, the way you use the politician, <laughs> right, the way you use it, those guys should have been responsible. And how you have used the instruments? I don't know.
incentive. Okay. Let me so let me go on just by giving some some concrete examples of some of these uh, metadynamics, although just very much on the scratch on the on, on the surface. So in the case of the lattice kinetic theorem and lattice Boltzmann, uh, the idea is that you would solve for a fluid instead of taking the navier stokes equation, you mimic, in fact, the motion of very uh, stylized particles. Uh, for instance, take uh, a situation like this. In this, so the particles can only move along the links of this lattice. And as you see, out of each link, you have only nine possibilities. Okay? You can move uh, east, northeast, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so now take a situation like this at time t, and at time t plus 1, for instance, the blue arrow okay, would move from here to here, and so you find it in the center. And the same for the green arrow, which was here, at time t plus 1, you will find it here, and it will be here. So once you have gathered all the pseudoparticles, okay, because these are not real molecules, these are, this is just the probability, if you want, of finding a particle at that point given with the one of these nine velocities. Once they sit on the same side, they, of course, have to do something interesting. They have to interact. And the interaction normally results into a redistribution. Some blue goes into green, some green goes into blue. So you mix them up. But here I come to the point. The way you mix them up should be nonetheless respectful of the conservation principle. And if you do that uh, properly, I really don't feel like I have full lectures on this, but the, the point is simply that if you conserve the number of particles, you conserve the total momentum and the total energy, you can invent simple, really, I mean, quite simple as compared to the real Newtonian mechanics, rules of interaction, rule of engagement, such that when you look a large portion of this pseudo fluid from far apart, it would be exactly like uh, the Navier-Stokes behavior uh, system. And then you can do, I just took it randomly from the web, but we have a lot of picture from our own simulation, where this is, for instance, the typical Rayleigh-Bernard um, uh, instability. So you would heat up a fluid from below. And as you know, the competition between uh, gravity and heat transfer is such to generate mushrooms. And 
this structure can get very, co very complicated. And uh, the fact is that instead of solving the Navier-Stokes equation, you get quite, quite high quality results just by playing, uh, by playing this game. Now, I could spend a full lecture telling you why it is more convenient to do this than solving partial differential equation. But I, can I will only give you two points, one of which was covered already yesterday. Uh, you remember, I think you remember when we were talking about nonlinearities in general. And you remember that the Navier-Stokes equation, the fluid is transporting momentum along a trajectory, which is given by the veloc fluid velocity itself. So this term here is generates the cascade of energy, large scale to small scale. And that's the reason of uh, why turbulence is so hard, in fact, to describe, because you generate quite small structures. Here, it's a little bit like uh, general uh, gravitation versus uh, spatial relativity, because just to make a loose comparison, because here you have trajectories like this, and you have integrate, you have to know the velocity and how it moves along a path which is dictated by the velocity itself. So it's a self-interactive theory. Now, if the situation is smooth, fine, but how about a turbulent fluid where you would have quiescence and then big burst and things like this, you can immediately spot that dealing with, term, with this term here mathematically gets highly complicated. It can be any small source of numerical error might drive your system away from stability. In this simple lattice Boltzmann story, and lattice gas is the same, the great advantage is you never move the fluid, the variable along a trajectory which is dictated by the variable itself. The information always travels along simple linear trajectories. Okay, and this is the beauty of the, of the Boltzmann representation where the transport is like this. So you transport the probability of having a particle moving along a given direction. And here you cage your system. You put it to a nine-fold uh, cage. So you have eight, actually, because you have rest particles plus eight direction. But this velocity is independent of the quantity that you move. So at this level, f is just like the pepper I was showing before. It's just a passive scalar. It's just transported by the velocity. So you always move along a plane. And this plane, or along a line, and this line never changes in time. It doesn't know about the complexity of the fluid. That's an enormous advantage. OK? So that's exactly what I was saying here. So we move molecules, but molecules, molecules quote unquote, they are fictitious molecules. But basically, you have the rule of engagement of particle dynamics, although what you want to describe in the end is the complexity of the turbulent flow. And it's almost, it's, it's just beautiful that you can do it. And I remember I got the question <laughs> zillions of times. Are you really doing navier stokes Yes, come on, I mean, I'm showing you the quantitative. I mean, we have to work, I, I would say, at least for the last five years or even more, I would get, we would get the question, are you really doing navier stokes And by now, Lattice Boltzmann has thousands of papers, literally, I mean, around the literature. So just to say that this is a very uh, nice and, uh, of course, the one I'm most familiar with uh, example where the, this notion of meta dynamics uh, has been pretty successful. But of course, uh, I'm making a long story very short because I can promise that you do things properly. Once you get the basic idea, which is do uh, put the system in a cage and do the simplified dynamics, then the details really do matter. In order to get the correct Navier-Stokes equation, for instance, that's also a very interesting story. I cannot resist telling you a little bit of historical background. This game was started in 76. There was a, a three people in France, Sardi, Pomo, de Passis, HPP. They wanted to study the statistical dynamics of particle system living in a simple uh, square uh, like this. So you only have east, north, uh, west, and south. And if you try to do fluid dynamics on this grid, it's total disaster. You never, ever get a vortex. The vortex will be a square. You will never, ever get the right uh, behavior. So you will invent, you will horribly break the links I was mentioning before. 
And the, no, because this kind of lattice is not uh, uh, homogeneous, it's not uniform in two dimensions. It's not isotropic. Yes. yes. It's not. yes. But the beauty of nature is that 10 years later, if Pomoc, and I saw, well, I can tell you the story. If Pomoc came to this guy and said, uh, uh, why, guys, why don't you do this? <laughs> a new world of concept, an entirely new world. There was a big paper in the new, I think it was in the New Scientist, I mean, by Frisch, as Lacke Pomoc, 86. Frisch, as Lacke Pomoc. And this is RD Pomo de Passis, which in Italian passing means crazy. So. And there is one invariant here, Pomo Pomo. And I saw Pomo in a conference in 88. The business was just, uh, the thing was just started. And he had his uh, workbook, because Frisch was doing a lot of, uh, I mean, he was pushing and said, this is the way we will crack turbulence. And I think in this country, there was a paper, I think in the New Scientist, or maybe in the New York Times, I mean, really making big waves. And all the people doing fluid dynamics were kind of <laughs> somewhat worried. So this is the way we will solve fluid dynamics from now on. But as a matter of fact, uh, in a conference in 88, Pomo uh, had this photocopy of his uh, notebook. And the copy carried this hexagon. And in France, it was suggestion to UF. So he made clear that <laughs> the idea came from him because he had been there before. But just to say, apart from this historical point, the fact is that by moving by a simple uh, square symmetry to a still very simple hexagon really changes completely the world. You know, this term, the U grad U, there is a bay when you go into Landau Lifshitz, you are told that no matter how you take the orientation of your coordinate frame, the fluid should look the same, which is called isotropy. And you can formalize it. It's, but essentially, it is that the, the physics should not depend on the orientation. And if you do that, the physics does depend on the orientation. You would expect that. The really fancy thing that in this case, it does not. So as far as this term, this term, not another term, is concerned, an hexagon is just like a sphere. You cannot tell them apart. So these particles, well, now I show you with nine because this is more practical. But it could be on, a, on an hexagon. So this particle would not know the difference between a cycle and an, an hexagon. And that's why you can play the game. So that's a typical example where, in fact, you do not try to derive, I don't know of any derivation of this dynamics from the molecular dynamics. I don't think it does exist. But still, you capture the absence. In capturing the absence, you have to be serious. You have to know that at some point, there are some mathematical and physical terms that you have to reproduce properly. And the game as to this game would be a total disaster. This is OK. So that's, in my opinion, really a perfect example of what the metadynamics means. And then, of course, there are many technicalities. And you have to do a serious job. But I remember in the early days, people would always argue, how is it possible? Can such a simple thing? reproduce vortices, turbulence, how can you? And now you design cars, actually, with this method. And you had the talk by Udon Chen a few months ago. I mean, you saw the, the pictures, right? I think a simple argument there is you have to couple the two uh, uh, directions. Yeah? That's why the hexagon works. Uh, if you have diagonal terms in the square lattice, that will work also. Frankly speaking, Tim, I think that solid state people would react exactly as you say. Obviously, it has to be like that. Obviously, it's like that. But for the fluid dynamics, this was, this was a kind of revelation. Except that Pomo, uh, Pomo manifestly knew it. He didn't even do the job. He really said, why don't you try this? And then at, in Los Alamos, I mean, there was, uh, there was a free, a slacker was in Los Alamos, by the way. And they wanted to build a special purpose machine. So it was a really big thing. Now, the lattice automata didn't make it for other reasons. They were too noisy. And that's why lattice Boltzmann picked up. But that's another story. If it's coupling the x and y, is it not the triangular lattice should work? Uh, you know, the triangular no. lattice and the hexagonal in mean, two dimensions is the same thing. If you draw the triangular lattice, is the same. Well, no. Uh, you mean the honeycomb? No, no, not the honeycomb. The honeycomb is no, another the story. The triangular lattice is the same. Yeah, that's, we draw the hexagon, draw all the lines, 
I have to draw all the lines. Yes, that's the diagonal one is also yeah, it's the same thing. But I have but six lengths. Yes, but it's, but uh, with three lengths, you're still coupling x and y. No, three lengths is you mean. But you have to have you always need inversion. I mean, you can't go yeah. only in one direction. If you go in one direction, you have to be allowed to go in exactly the opposite. So that's forcing okay. you to be exactly. Right. Otherwise, you violate paths. That's right. Yeah. If you go one way, you have to be going so, the other way as well. Yes. So there are a number of symmetries and. Well, I could lecture and <laughs> do the full lecture on that, but it really belongs to what we are saying. The, the game started to be really exciting when you tried to move to three dimensions because people say, fine, I accept that you can do 2D, but real life in 3D. I'm a, I'm a Ford engineer, I'm a BMW engineer, I want to design BMW. And another funny thing happens. You would say, okay, I go to a crystal, right? No crystal in 3D can do the job. Pardon? Uh, wait a minute. As long as you impose that the velocity of the particle is, there is just one velocity in the, the, the magnitude. You see, in the hexagon, they have six different directions, but the amplitude is always the same. So in those days, but I'm really lecturing on lattice gas. In those days, they wanted to keep the velocity, the, the bit representation, zero or one. So either the particle is there, bit down, or the part is not there, or if it is there, it has to be just one velocity because then I give just one bit. So they really wanted to stick to the one bit representation, Fermi system. So they, they thought, okay, now I go to 3D, but I want to keep all the speeds the same magnitude. And with that restriction, there is no lattice which gives you the correct isotopy. It doesn't work. FCC, we, it should work. Yeah. No, it doesn't work. Yes. Well, that's a normal one. Has it been tried? What? The links can be less than one. No, they're not all people. No, there's 12 neighbors that are exactly the same distance. I see that your solid state sound is really. Yeah, but that's crying. the equivalent of a sphere in 3D, just like the hexagon is the equivalent so of a sphere. So, what is FC, FCC? You have 12 speeds. Face center cubic. Okay, but face center cubic means yes. that uh, they have all the same. No, that's not. You cannot reproduce this tent. Basically, you need fourth order tensors. Well, sorry, I don't want to get too technical, but I think it's interesting. What you need in terms of group theory, okay, solid state, to reproduce Navier-Stokes, you want to take a tensor of order four, V, 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 sub I, sub I, sub I, okay? So I runs over the discrete speeds, so in that case it's nine, and this guy has to be isotropic. And the face center will not do the job for you. So what they had to do, they had to go to a face, to a hypercube in 4D. And 4D, I learned later that some, a lot of magic properties happen. And project it back. That's what they did. It's really a funny story. But in 3D, if you insist on the fact that V sub i is either 0, so the particle does not exist, or 1, then uh, there is no uh, lattice which would make the, uh, the Navier-Stokes tensor isotropic. Pardon? Oh, it's, the, it's, the, the, it's a discrete group of rotations. But you have to have enough. I mean, in this case, in the case of the hexagon, I, I, isotropy is a continuous group, no matter how you any uh, rotation by any angle should leave the equations invariant. Here you have the, the, I think you call it S of six uh, uh, symmetry, ordinary symmetry six, means that basically only rotation of two pi over six will keep your system invariant. In three dimension, I think I have picture here. Now. Basically you need, it, it's called face center hypercube. Uh, I'm not sure I cannot plot, I can plot it, but basically it has the six neighbors. If you take a cube, sorry, take a cube. I have other presentation, but it would take some a while. And then you have this, the face centers, plus you have all the edge centers, okay? But, and that's the beauty of it, along the four, the six um, uh, direct connection, you have to think in terms of an extra dimension where you would have plus and minus. And that's the face center hypercube in 4D. And if you have this fourth dimension, 
it works. So what they did, they did the formulate a system with 24 particles. So you have six particles along the, the face centers. You have 12 connecting uh, the edge centers makes 18, but you double them because you double the, in the nearest connection, so you get 24. And in 4D, they have all the same modules. I can, I mean, it will take me a few minutes, but if you want tomorrow, I can show you. But just to say that uh, to play this metadynamics game, sometimes you have to be very ingenious because there are some serious constraints that you cannot break. We have been talking about irrelevant detail. The real art is to tell what is irrelevant and what is relevant. That's the real art in any system. So if you know your system well, you can inject reasonable knowledge. If you don't know the physics, I mean, you can only generate disasters, right? But this is a really very interesting story. If you want to know more, I can include I mean, I can change the, the, the program of my lecture, no problem. So, but uh, just to say that, um, and the reason why the game didn't really make it into serious CFT was not because of the symmetry, but because of the Boolean nature. But, I mean, you realize how beautiful this dynamics is. It's exact. You compute, you do fluid dynamics in integer, in Boolean. So all the operations in your computer are exact, no round off. It was a, this was really a revolution. Unfortunately, you, you are hit back by the fact that since you have only Boolean numbers, you generate signals which are very, very noisy. And by the time you have to average over a sufficiently large region to get a smooth signal, then you lost a lot of advantage. Plus, the other problem is, with the bits, is that if I want to do now a two fluid, I want to do combustion, I want to do chemistry, the number of collisions I have here is two to the power of states. So in this case, I have 2 to the power 24 collision, which is already 16 million. That's why Los Alamos wanted to build a special purpose machine. If I want to do two fluids, I have 2 to the power 48. That's really what killed the subject. And that's why Lattice Boltzmann, in fact, uh, took off. Because in Lattice Boltzmann, the particle I'm showing there, they are probabilities. They are not occupation numbers. This is like a Fermi system, 0, 1, right? It tests Fermi statistics, literally. Uh, by the time you replace the occupation number with the probabilities, then you're back to floating point. So you are much less revolutionary, but you can design cars. Maybe the lattice gas will make a comeback. Who knows? Anyway, that's an interesting example of meta dynamics. And if you want to, do, to know more, of course, I'll be happy to provide you with many, many details. That's a story we know very well, and we are playing this game very much here as well. Uh, that's another example which I'm less familiar with, but it seems to be quite successful too. Um, the, it's called dissipative particle dynamics. Um, and essentially, and there, there is uh, somehow a more formal basis for it. So you just group a number of molecules together, you generate a super particle, and the idea is certainly not new. But then they postulate a dynamics, which is, uh, it's again our capital X. Eh? So capital P is the uh, total momentum of this macroparticle. And they postulate, they do not derive, that these two macroparticles would interact through three types of uh, forces. So there will be a conservative force between I and J. I and J go, uh, are the index for the macroparticle. Eh? So you don't see the, the little blues. And this could be Leonard Jones or the kind of thing that you would use in an atomistic simulation. Plus, you have a um, dissipative interaction, which is postulated. There is some weight function. This could be a Gaussian or something which gives the profile of the macroparticle. And then there is a term, which is a scalar product of the Rij, which is the line between the center mass of the two particles. And Pij is the relative speed. So this is a kind of drag. It, it reminds the gamma V in Langevin. And this force is, again, central. It is oriented along the uh, uh, line joining the centers of the two macroparticles. And finally, there is, as usual, the uh, noisy component, which is psi here is not is a fluctuation. It's just a random number. So in the simulation, you would draw a random number. W is still the same shape function. 
So it's a smooth particle, and r hat is again the uh, unit vector along the along the um, common direction. So it's basically a, a sort of sophisticated Langevin equation with local momentum conservation because these forces are designed in such a way that momentum is conserved. And uh, uh, unlike the, the, the lattice um, gas serrate automata, there are papers here where they claim, and I think they are basically correct, that they can derive this system uh, just by coarse grain in molecular dynamics. In this case, the fundamental uh, link is clear. And again, I just drew randomly um, something from the web. This method appears to be pretty good for soft matter simulation, mesoscopic soft matter simulation. So how a membrane would assemble and uh, or polymer um, tangles, situation which are manifestly way too complicated to deal with finite differences or, fi or grid matters because the geometry is just too wide. So there is uh, quite a good deal of work with, with this uh, dissipative particle dynamics. And here I just included for, say, cultural reasons. Um, I'm not so sure whether uh, you can really group all this method all together. But again, I think here you're more familiar with me than me with this. But uh, the very famous ab initio of Carparinello molecular dynamics reminds me quite a lot of the same game because when they postulate this Lagrange and then they put this, this as a kinetic energy of the, of the electrons, right? Um, and then, as you know, once they write the Euler-Lagrange equation for this Lagrange, they end up with an equation of motion for the orbitals, which is like uh, uh, atomistic dynamics. So it looks like a classical uh, dynamics. And, uh, and they play games with the parameters. For instance, the electronic mass is made much higher in order to keep the orbitals uh, sticking to the born oppenheimer surface. So just to say that this Lagrangian is again postulated and extremely successful as far as I can tell. And uh, OK, another example of, uh, and that's again Parinello is leading the way. Uh, sometimes you violate, you generate metadynamics in, in, ex, in which uh, you, uh, by design, in fact, you want to put some memory to your system. That's again a beautiful, uh, I think, tool, and I think it's quite general. The, the, the problem here is to explore the landscape of uh, biological structure. Landscape means that you have maybe 50 or 100 uh, variables. So the position of the, of the molecules, the angles between uh, the bonds, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to find the minima of some function like the free energy in an underdimensional space. And, and you have to sample this space in, a, in an efficient way. And how do you do that? Uh, one way which I find interesting, I'm not an expert in that, but um, I think the, the, the essence is the following. Uh, you take particles, OK, so this is a usual uh, this part here is the usual um, molecular dynamics. Um, there are some interaction between the particles. Sometimes they don't even interact. But the crucial point is that particles leave bridges behind. So if I have a particle like this and I'm exploring this, uh, this valley, whenever I go through a certain point, I leave a, say, a shape function, a Gaussian, so that this would be this particle here. This particle here would move all along and would leave, say, a few Gaussian, so that the particle which comes next would not have to go through the same path again, but it could somehow jump over here. And uh, the analogy is that, uh, essentially, you don't want to swim into an empty pool, OK? Because <laughs> if you swim in an empty pool, you never uh, go to the right <laughs> where you want to go. So by, in fact, so you are depositing essentially Gaussian, so G is this Gaussian, which is deposited to the point where the trajectory is, OK? So essentially Q, if I write correct, when particle I moves, it will, she will find the Gaussian deposited by all the particles which have uh, been uh, coming before. I'm not so sure that this formula is quite correct from the formal point of view, but the idea is there. So there is a you build a notion of history. And by doing that, it's just like filling up the C so that you can get to the right minimum much, much faster than by mere molecular. Molecular dynamics would, would take you forever. Oh, yes. Previously, you said you have a 
not different artificial microscopic lens, but the target microscopic lens is my result. It's my target. I, I achieve it and that's it. That's Here it. you lose completely the notion of dynamics. This is completely artificial, it's just a mean of sampling, exploring lens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that using the same name for can be, can be dangerous. No, to me here, meta means that I take the dynamics of uh, the, the real dynamics and I somehow modify it with new terms which serve my purpose. No, no, I agree with you that one should be careful in, uh, in uh, classifying things a little bit more precisely. But <clears throat> nonetheless, you could think of exploring an underdimensional landscape doing uh, particle dynamics the Newton dynamics, okay? And the point is that you don't want to do that because if you do ordinary uh, Newtonian dynamics, it will take centuries, okay? So these are tricks that you invent to get to, to the goal. I, I agree with you that here the goal is, uh, how, how do you formalize the goal? That you Just information. Yes, but done through dynamics. But, so what, yeah, if, if we know where we put all the Gaussian, we should be able to kind of guess, go backwards and guess the real dynamics. Mm, only in, uh, in equilibrium terms. This is a method that works only in global equilibrium terms. While the previous one is aimed to general non equilibrium situations. Nice. Good. So, if I can repeat the thing, what Simone is saying is that. It's a kind of misleading to use the same word metadynamics for two examples, which are qualitatively different. Um, here, and all the more so here, we know exactly, we know mathematically, what I'm trying to repeat for the, for the record, what the goal is, and we have rather constrained, I mean, the constraints are quite clear. Whether we can match the constraint or not is another story, but we know what they are. What Simone is saying is that here, once again, Simone, you are violating badly what? This, uh, this is artificial land, but Carparinello is also artificial no, land. Let's take what they are, the theorem. You can tell that the forces are almost correct. And for the electrons, no. For the electrons, no, it's artificial. So it is in the same league. But the quantum dynamics is much, it's not given by. That's what I'm saying. So, uh, okay, maybe the classification could be tricks which have a solid and well-defined target and tricks which just serve a practical purpose. But, I mean, they do belong to the same family, in my opinion. It's maybe too broad. Okay, anyway, here I think I'm not an expert of this. To me, it's not obvious at all how uh, would I know because if I can play this Gaussian game, I could take the particle off the real minimum as well. So I don't know how they deal with this problem. So I think this procedure is by no means uh, systematic as far as I understand. But I just wanted to give an example of a situation where, in fact, uh, um, uh, you, you modify, you kind of accelerate. You don't play the dynamics that nature is playing just because you cannot afford it. I mean, so you have to invent tricks because exactly, we, have to, we have to live with the principle of least computing. Nature doesn't have this constraint. So that, is, uh, that was my point. So I think I'm basically at the end of the philosophical part. And tomorrow, I, I must stand away for today, just 15 minutes. Yeah. So I don't, I'm not sure it's worthwhile to, um, to start anything new. But and from to, tomorrow and the lay, day later, I will show you some practical example, so it will be really a change in the, in the style. But just to summarize a few things which I hope you can retain no matter uh, what your um, application field is. So let's see, probably this list is incomplete, but uh, of course uh, this is something obvious. Of course, grain entails uncertainty, information loss. Well, in the first place we said that we need multiscale whenever a cross-case correlation uh, cannot be passed out, and I hope I gave you at least a flavor for the um, general um, uh, feature of physical system where this happened. So the retrieving the lost information is an art in the sense that doing it the hard way might be just unrealistically complex. 
And one thing which I forgot to mention, and it's, it is also important, that it is an art not only because you have to invent fictitious dynamics, but also because even the splitting, which in my case, I just gave you the trajectory, is almost obvious. I say, OK, I do some filtering. I smooth out the signal. And what is left out is the fluctuation. But when you go to the realistic system, this divide is by no means obvious. So it is not obvious how to choose the so-called collective variables and the fast variables. So this fast slow borderline uh, might be a job in itself. And as a quite general <laughs> statement, this I, I think applies all along, that the game of coarse graining is certainly uh, worthwhile because you generate many fewer equations, but generally they are much more complex. They, they can be much more complex. And uh, the case uh, uh, Navier-Stokes versus Boltzmann or Navier-Stokes versus Lattice Boltzmann is really uh, a quite telling example in point. I mean, uh, by working at kinetic theory, you don't have this uh, u grad u. You replace u grad u with v grad f, and this is much better object to work with. Although f lives in a six-dimensional space. Configuration space, velocity space. So you have double the dimension. In principle, it's a stupid thing to do, but in practice, the payoff can be uh, quite rewarding. They, uh, in general, uh, the point of uh, generating fewer equations is because you can inject, as we said, your uh, knowledge about the system and do statistical closures. That's the way, I would say, uh, engineers, that's the typical path that engineering took in trying to, uh, for instance, in turbulence modeling, they are the mainstream, by far the mainstream of turbulence modeling is here. They constantly try to generate coarse grain equation and Sometimes they look horribly complicated, sometimes a little bit less, but they are still very much in this mode. Computational chemists, in my opinion, is, well, it's just my opinion, so not that I would claim uh, that I have the full picture, but it seems to me that this computational metadynamics is really much more in the territory of computational physics and computational chemistry. So instead of uh, trying to cause grain, you, you try to invent a fictitious dynamics, which would serve the purpose you are pursuing. Um, so this is the end of this uh, uh, initial part, which in fact two, took two lectures instead of one, and I'm only pleased of that. So if there, is, uh, if there are any questions at this point, I would be happy to take them. Otherwise, we could just perhaps start to see what the, what the next lecture. In fact, I think it is better if <coughs> I would skip the next lecture altogether, which would be still in the um, mathematical abstract mood. And tomorrow, I will just give you an example. So uh, let me see what. If, if you have questions in between, I will be happy to take them. Let me see if I have anything in the lecture I, I plan for today, actually, which uh, I would like to say before skipping to the practical part. So if you have any question, please don't hesitate. So let's see if I have anything in the next lecture for the next 10 minutes. So what I planned, but I think at this point, this would be really boring, just to show you, I prepared a sort of uh, bird's eye view of the methods I made a claim that analytical mathematics is kind of ill-suited to handle the problems we were talking about. But I mean, that would be a, a miserable statement in, in a sense, because there are, of course, a whole array of pretty elegant and powerful techniques, although none of them would really uh, be able to take uh, multi-scale problems in, in full generality. And that's why, that's what we have been discussing today. In fact, there has been a sort of cultural change and with this metadynamics and, and uh, other type of technique. Let me see if I have something here, instead of going through these methods, which I want to say. Yes, yeah, so there is maybe, this is maybe worth, worth saying. So these are, no way, it would be a waste of time at this point to go through the techniques. Yes, let me, let me tell you what the general philosophy of the thing that we will be seeing tomorrow is, and we will end up with this. And tomorrow I'll show some examples of this. So essentially, let me use this. 
the methods that people are putting in place, including ourselves, essentially uh, are based on the following idea. And I will just use five minutes for that. Um, the idea is the following. So you try to compute the least, do the least amount of computing, least possible amount of computing. So that means that you try to, and we make the assumption that computing at the macro level will be much less expensive than computing at the micro level. Say fluid dynamics versus uh, uh, molecular dynamics or quantum mechanics, even, even more so. So you try to stick, in fact, to the macroscopic description as much as you, as you can, but you uh, acknowledge that every now and then you need to go back to the fundamental level because by staying on the macroscopic trail, you know that you are introducing errors. And I'm not talking the usual numerical errors that you have anyway, I'm talking representation errors. So the philosophical point, so you have uh, a sort of two trail strategy where you stick to the macroscopic description every now and then, and you have to decide when, you move down so you uh, reconstruct the microscopic state, so you go macro to micro, tuck. you do a stitch of microscopic evolution using your favorite method, might be molecular dynamics, might be tight binding uh, quantum mechanics, you go along this uh, trail for a certain while, and then at some point, as soon as you can, you go back to the, least, uh, to the less expensive trail. And so it's just a two-way, uh, two-time procedure. And of course, it's very easy for me to draw this blue box here, but of course here you immediately see that uh, there are issues related to the boundary condition and how you couple these two different, and that's really, a very highly detailed uh, job, and the success of your strategy is, will ultimately depend on, on what you do in this blue box. So, but the philosophy is that uh, uh, at either levels, both macro and micro, you could in principle use the metadynamic model you uh, choose, provided you, may, you, you, you are confident that uh, it, would reproduce, it will reproduce the physics you are you're trying to explore. So the strategy we will see is essentially advance the macro solver for a time capital delta t, okay. You move down with a so-called reconstruction because you have to reconstruct the microscopic sp uh, space. So this is a, you don't move time. This uh, indicated with an arrow, but the arrow should be in fact vert vertical because time is frozen. You advance the microscopic solver to a certain amount of time, small delta t, so from here to there. And then, of course, you have to project. Remember, yesterday we did projection and reconstruction operators. So you reproject back to the macro state, and you go. So the idea is that this microscopic solver should, in fact, heal, that's the H-E-A-L, the errors, representation errors, which have been uh, uh, generated working on the macroscopic level. And if the system is reasonably well behaved, uh, this, the error generated here will decay very fast as soon as you uh, run uh, the, the microscopic solver for a little stretch of microsc microscopic evolution should be enough to bring the system back to where it be belongs. So that's a very different uh, philosophy as compared to cross graining. And uh, well, here there would be a full lecture in try to show what uh, uh, what the constraints and what the, the 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 payoffs for this procedure are. But let me I will just confine to to one thing: the potential gains in doing this strategy. Sorry, what is it? I, want, I just wanted to, to give you, I lost, I was, I had a slide before where I was showing the payoff and I lost it. Where is it? Ah, here it is maybe. Yeah, this is, okay. Just to give you an idea of, of the potential gains in, in playing this game. Very, very roughly speaking. Just let me use, yeah, five minutes is enough. Very, very roughly speaking. Suppose I have, again, this is the simplest 
possible example. Suppose I have a molecular dynamic system and, and delta x will be basically the size of this box. And I decide that all the molecules within this box can be represented, say, by a density, by a velocity, and by some pressure. So I replace them with a few, just a handful of macroscopic degrees of freedom. And, uh, and I advance these macroscopic degrees of freedom from 10t, from 10t to 10t plus capital delta t. Okay. So I move in time. Very, very roughly speaking, <laughs> The gain is that basically I have, I have coarse grain over the coarse grain factor will be capital delta x, the size of the box, versus small delta x, which is the mean separation, every separation between the molecules, right? So if I have, say, 1,000 molecules into this box, this factor delta x, this factor here will be 1,000. And these molecules, of course, if I want to advance the molecules according to their molecular dynamics, I will have to use a small delta t, whereas when I march the macro solver, I will jump in uh, steps of capital delta t. So basically what I have to gain is the volume factor, macro volume versus micro volume, and the, uh, the, the time factor, okay? Plus, and this would be again uh, is something we have discussed, touching a little bit upon yesterday. I will make the sum, chi is a computational density, which means how much floating point of operation I have to put to advance a, delta, a one degrees of freedom by a time step delta t, microscopic. And macro is the equivalent for the macro uh, solver. So that means how many operation I have to do to move a single microscopic variable by a man amount delta t. So you immediately see that by replacing this box of uh, 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 um, molecules with a single or a few microscopic degrees of freedom, the potential gain is the four volume, the ratio of the volume and the time, so the volume in four dimensional space time, times the ratio of the corresponding computational density. Now in practice, if you go all, uh, over the literature, you see that in general, the, you cannot make this case separation one million, of course, uh, because otherwise the system will be totally decoupled. But it's quite ordinary, for instance, when you do a multi-scale simulation of fluids, as the one I will show you tomorrow, typically the box separation of the order 100, uh, which is uh, maybe even more, uh, but say of the order 100 or 1,000, this is just uh, orders of magnitude. The time step separation between atomistic and, and fluid dynamics in general is under. We use, here we are, we are much, more, much more aggressive, but typically in the literature you find a time step of order 100. And in general, computing a microscopic degrees of freedom, uh, the unit cost of a microscopic degrees of freedom is, tends to be larger than the macro. So I took here just a factor of 10. But it's just really ballpark guess. The, po the only point I want to make is that if you we, if we just put them together, so we get about five orders of magnitude gain. And uh, please appreciate that in the, in the current Moore's law uh, metric, 20 year, 10 to the power 5 means more than 20 years Moore's law. So if you are smart enough and you can do a successful multi-scale, uh, put in place a successful multi-scale strategy, typically you would gain about 20 years of Moore's law. So I mean, just to say that the payoff is there. It's the, the game is not just, they're not just working in a little corner. There is uh, certainly wide scope for this uh, strategy. But of course, uh, any gain comes with its fair share of pain. And the pain is that this is a little bit too formal. But I mean, uh, essentially, the point is that if you define this gap, G, as the ratio between the macro length and the micro, and you could have the same for uh, time, but I just took one for simplicity. Uh, essentially, uh, this G, the separation is the inverse of the separation, or the inverse of the gap, actually, is the epsilon, which we used yesterday. You remember when I said quite, quite general terms that a given quantity gets contribution from the zeros level, the first level, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, it is clear that if I take this scale separation gap too large, my errors will be just uh, unacceptable. So again, uh, one has to be, the, the figures I gave you before in the previous slides are realistic. Apparently, for the system as we know today, 
you can take steps of 10 unders, but you cannot take, you know, average over one zillion molecules. Otherwise, it would be just free lunch. And the, the typical situation where this game is really tricky and can be uh, touchy is when, the, uh, again, I'm formal, but I think the meaning is quite clear. If uh, yesterday we said that the, um, if the contribution at, at each level of the physics is uh, pre-multiplied by the scale separation, and normally beta would be one in a normal condition. So I have level zero, level one would be the microscopic. But uh, the, the error I, I, I generate by just rescaling the coarse grain in my variables can be shown that, I mean, I have no time for that, but it's, it's really trivial, it can be shown to be uh, uh, marginal as long as the leading term is dominating. It is clear that you are in a situation like in phase transition where the leading term eventually goes to zero, then any modification of this gap could generate unbearable errors. And that's again a criteria for, pay, for playing the game. So as long as the zero order physics is dominant, you can modify your uh, underlying dynamics heavily and still have, suppose you have, in, in nature, epsilon is 10 to minus 6, suppose. Uh, or I give you a practical example, actually. Um, uh, take a flow through a porous media, the Knudsen number, which is the separation between the mean free particle of the, of, uh, of the molecule, so the average distance between two collisions is, and the size of the medium is about um, two orders of magnitude, at least, or three. So you have an, an, a smallness parameter, which is 10 to minus three. Now, the effect of this ratio on the physical quantity, say the amount of flow that you are pushing through the porous media, feels a quadratic dependence on this parameter. I give this for granted as an example. So this is an analytical smooth dependence. So it means that if I change this scale separation, instead of 10 to minus 3, I make it 10 to minus 2, instead of, of having an effect 10 to minus 6, so I don't want to. So the physical separation is 10 to minus 3, and this affects the leading order quadratically. So I have an effect 10 to minus 6 in nature. I could say, OK. I want to compute much less. I want to make my system bigger by factor 100. So my scale separation, my separation will be 10 to minus 1 because I've artificially blown up a parameter. Since this parameter enters the physics Q0 quadratically, I will have an error 10 to minus 2. For many practical purposes, so 10 to minus 6 will be the real physical effect, but which has to be summed up to something which is value 1. So instead of having 1 plus 10 to minus 6, I have 1 plus 10 to minus 2. So what? And we do play this game constantly when you use, for instance, lattice Boltzmann through power speed. So if you have a smallness parameter, which is really small in nature, and this smallness parameter acts analytically upon the macro level, the system is forgiving. And you can play the blow up game pretty much. But that's not necessarily the case. If you are doing some physics where the leading order is 10 to minus 6, there is no way you can blow up any parameter. So once again, you have to know where you are standing. In many cases, nature is kind enough, and it's littered with smallness parameter, which can be magnified. And this is the subject of so-called accelerated dynamics, if you are dealing with time, or coarse grain if you are dealing with space. So basically, you artificially blow up smallness parameters, which are offered to us by nature. And nature is kind enough in this respect. It's full with smallness parameters. But again, no free lunch, so one has to be careful. But the whole issue of multiscale computing is just try to identify these smallness parameters and blow them up whenever you can. And by doing so, you can really move big strides in, in terms of Moore's law. So it's a beautiful game. OK, so I will end up here. And I think tomorrow and the day after, I will give you finally a few practical examples. I've, I hope I have not been too philosophical, but I think there were a number of general ideas that would apply to independently on your specific field. OK, thanks for your attention.